Pomponius Mela was the first Roman geographer, and he had asserted that the Antipodes, the regions of the world on the other side of their spherical planet, would be forever inaccessible and unknowable. In the same way, these canid pack hunters had been inscrutable to the colonists. That was, until the offensive. When we last left the colonists on dawn, they had withstood a large offensive by the original inhabitants. They were standing, sure, but they were also broken. Many still held out hope that the overdue aurora would arrive, but they could not agree on a singular vision for their overstretched settlements. The CSF, that being the Colonial Security Force, had executive control, supplanting the Ariadnan Council in Mott. They had made some headway in blunting the Antipodes' reconquest. Nobody could deny that. The sound of war drums was still playing every night in the new settlement to the east, Mount Zion, and most of the colonists were glad for the central security. However, the seeds of dissolution had been planted back on Earth. Top secret orders given to military staff meant that the different military formations were to protect their own countrymen over their foreign neighbors. A few voices on the CSF were even demanding culturally pure areas filled with homogenous ethnic and linguistic groups to increase productivity and security. These internal rifts were compounded by infighting between the civilian Ariadnan Council and the CSF. Less than a year after landfall, Cossacks and Southern Europeans cemented control of Mutt and founded a Cossack-majority nation named Rodina. The captain of the Ariadna, Muradov, lent some credence to this. The decision to centralize power around a new, unfriendly political actor was referred to by the rest of the settlers as the Abandonment Decree, and led to a series of separations. Many Americans fled and settled en masse at Mount Zion. Now nicknamed The Wall, the Americans went so far as to declare this U.S. Ariadna and the 51st State of the Union. Northern European soldiers had founded the mining town of Scone during the Bloody Race, and they quickly created Kalyat Laif Bastion, or Forest Lion, as the nexus of the new country of Caledonia. Finally, the French delegation evacuated to a natural road hub between Rodina and the north. They declared themselves the Republic of Merovingia, centered around their new town of Marianbourg itself named after Marianne, a symbol of the French Republic. With the balkanization of dawn complete, the colonists now looked inward instead of toward the stars. It was clear that Earth had abandoned them, and if they did arrive, most of the colonists agreed that they would be treated harshly. Bienvenue Station was a space platform designed to be the hub of trade when the Aurora arrived. It was now abandoned and left adrift. Before making landfall, the Ariadna had also deployed a series of probes to other parts of the Helios system. The telemetry and data on Tythonus, Ushas, Estris, and the Armstrong Belt was all but useless now for a planetary-bound civilization. Other probes deployed to Tereshkova, Saranyu, and Albina were slowly left to drift and eventually went dark in the cold of space. The formal militaries all collapsed over the course of the next decade. The American Ranger units disintegrated. The continental European troops followed suit. The Russian units abandoned their hierarchy, but retained more cohesion than the others. This was due to their Cossack traditions. Cossacks are a cultural group from the wilderness of Ukraine and southern Russia. They have a long history as nomads and warriors. Anyone could flee the shackles of society and join the Cossacks as long as they were Christian. They fought with and against Russia up through World War II wherein the Cossack military units were officially disbanded. During the fall of the Soviet Union, though, many Cossacks reclaimed their heritage and even gained recognition from the Russian government. For many, this meant a return to time-honored traditions like dancing, horse riding, self-sufficiency, stern discipline. The Cossacks were the vanguard of the troops that Russia assigned to Project Dawn. They were perhaps the best prepared to weather the Depression. This was Dawn's darkest period. Famines, pillaging, and banditry all became commonplace. Technology began to break down without replacements. Antipodes resumed their raids. Hyper-reactionaries like DNA Riadna spouted extremist values. There were smaller Antipodes attacks from the region known as Tartary in the west. In the east, they smashed against the wall. The Americans were only saved by the establishment of the USARF. Old Man Ross, a veteran of 21st century conflicts, went down to the Blockhouse. It was the busiest bar in all of Franklin County. He gave a massive, rousing speech, the details of which are completely unclear. I don't think anyone could actually hear him over the shouting. Regardless of what he said, what he did was establish the USARF, which became US Ariadna's new ranger force to defend against enemies both alien and human. Back in Rodina, 
the Cossacks were stabilizing. Cossack culture had always valued military service. Like medieval knights or Roman legionaries, they bought and maintained their own equipment, and every Cossack, regardless of sex, knew how to fight. To pass these values on to the new generation in Dawn, they founded the Military Officer School of Novocherkask in Mat, and implemented the Stanitsa system across Rodina. Stanitsas were inspired by traditional Cossack settlements. Every town was a militarized and defensible village that worked together for communal defense. If one Stanitsa was attacked, the others would rush in to help. In exchange, every Stanitsa had to contribute troops. They would be led by a hetman as a civilian leader to prevent them from becoming military dictatorships, usually a scientist or Roscosmos admin. The results were mixed. On the one hand, the simple and effective system provided excellent protection from Antipodes raids. On the other, it led to a permanent militarization of Rodina culture. The hetman was often sidelined in favor of security and order, and the focus on army life probably contributed to technological stagnation. Still, you couldn't argue with the results. Caledonia established their own system of Scottish-inspired clans to mimic the Stanitsas, with similarly mixed results. They swore blood oaths and organized around charismatic fighters, and provided their own strategic reserve of warriors and resources. Clans were not necessarily based around families and genealogical lineage, but instead as social ties in lieu of a planetary defense force. Also unlike the Stanitsa, each clan had a great deal of overall authority of its own internal affairs, with the elected Justicar wielding personal executive authority over national policy. As you might expect of any Scottish stereotype in a war game, the clans also fought each other. A lot. Damn Scots! They ruined Scotland! You Scots sure are a contentious people. You just made an enemy for life! In Merovingia, times were tough, but self-suffering can be elevated into an art form in Merovingia. Everyone would tell tales, trying to outdo one another in the horrors they suffered, yet also the people of Marienburg would never cross the line into despair. They kept very real, if somewhat sporadic, trade routes with Mott. The city of Marienburg itself began to thrive, thanks to its proximity to the remaining trade routes, and reputation as an economic powerhouse. It became a cosmopolitan city, with its own unique sign language developing in lieu of an international language. Tugging on the earlobe meant closing the deal. Trade wasn't just a necessary and vital means of survival. It was also a way to maintain social and spiritual links between the fragmented settlements. But uh, not everyone valued the spirit of cooperation emerging inside these cities. Foragers and traders could walk for days between settlements, and U.S. Ariadnids built up a materialistic culture that valued their small bags of precious rations. There were thousands of roving outcasts, making their life as Mad Max-style raiders, not to mention all the Antipodes. The Ariadnan Council still held some sway, and representatives of all the nations of Dawn agreed to at least discuss the militarized Stanitsa system for co-defense. Merovingia's elite reaction forces were happy to join with the Russians. Back in Scone and the Wall, things were a little more difficult, and it took a great deal of political pressure to ratify the Stanitsa treaties. They eventually saw the light, though, and Dawn was united in a system of mutual self-defense. Here's the deal. I'm a tiny fish in a tinier pond. But I could get bigger. Every subscription brings me closer to my goal of 1,000 followers. Every comment trains Alphabet's algorithm to suggest my videos. And every like you give is a like that might draw attention to a war game that isn't Warhammer. So, you know, do any of those things if you like my content and want others to find it. Thanks. Now, back to Ariadna. Cossacks had a number of military traditions beyond horses. They taught the next generation of soldiers close combat with the saber and spear, restraint with their ammunition, and lightning-fast mobilization. Traditional Cossacks knew how to put down riots, prevent pogroms, and ward off lynchings. They were going to need all these skills and more. Dawn was entering a new age. This was the consolidation phase, an age of discovery. With it came a degree of backlash from the hardline conservatives, but the Stanitsa system was effective at isolating any extremist movements and keeping them away from power. The first discovery that the colonists made were the dog faces. When the Antipodes attack a pregnant creature, their claws and saliva can transmute their DNA to the target of their attack. The genetic code of the unborn creature is affected and partially overwritten, 
creating an entirely new species of hybrids that pass along the antipodal DNA. Further, antipodes have an innate instinct to bite, but not kill, pregnant life forms. Many of the first generation born on dawn had some very antipode features. This could be snout-like noses, claws, louder vocal cords, or copious and very fine hair. As they aged up, this generation displayed a new and bizarre trait. When enraged or injured, adult dog faces could literally transform into hulking, werewolf-like hybrids known as dog warriors. Many of the reactionaries were incensed and argued for their sterilization or extermination. But the government in Rodina was in favor of moderation, and dog faces would continue to propagate through attacks as well as birth. Two dog faces can reproduce and give birth to another dog face. A dog face coupled with a human, though, gave birth to a wolver. Unlike dog faces, wolvers cannot transform. They had even more antipodal features, thicker fur, more pronounced snouts, sharper teeth and claws. However, they suffered from issues with genetic stability and were sterile. Many wolvers and dog faces were all too happy to risk their lives and join the burgeoning Ariadne National Military. The newly created Naval Exploration Corps sailed the Mirror Sea and established numerous settlements across Dawn. Many of these were located to the west, in Tartary. This became the first large-scale settlement since the original colony ship's arrival, with Tartary founded as a buffer against the Antipodes to the north and west. Technology thought lost could be reconstructed, thanks to Merovingian merchants who could travel the roads and seas, connecting the hungry to the full, and every VMU to its rightful dreamcast. They even attempted to explore space. Space, the final frontier. Project Roving Star created a planet-wide comms network, and Dawnnet, or DNet. It was no internet, and definitely no Maya, but it was an accomplishment that the entire planet cheered. It ran across the headline of the Highland Herald newspaper, Ariadna returns to space! The Merovingians expanded the trade routes, building bridges and the tenuous mercantile networks that united the nations of Dawn. In this era, the trading traditions became entrenched. For the colonists of Marienburg especially, trade was seen as a form of bloodless combat between two opponents. Money was more a means to an end in Rodina, though. In Map, bigger and bigger taxes were levied. Larger requests for conscripts went out to the burgeoning frontiers of human settlement. The discovery of Tesium brought about a renaissance of industry and technology. Dawn was back on its feet. Which was good, because it was about to be knocked right back down. Violent storms and unexpected weather, concentrated in the north, led to small-scale famines and discontent. Caledonia had been settled by Irish, Danish, Welsh, English, and Norwegians, but it was around this time that the Scots culture overtook the rest due to demographics and the power of Scottish clans over the others. Many of the traditions that are now so important in Ariadne and culture emerged as well. The Malt Clavi is a Caledonian ritual that involves envoys carrying a small burning cask held aloft in a metal basket around which peaceful negotiations are held. They need every ounce of Scottish stubbornness in the face of the Second Antipode Offensive. Faced with starvation in the north and enemies to the south, dozens of tribes united together for a war of annihilation. Deep-seated resentment of the humans brought them together as they poured over the mountains and rivers, attacking on all fronts at once. Every victory was costly, and each win would be followed by an even costlier defeat. Many small, and even some large, settlements were destroyed. Brigadoon, toulouse le bois and Springfield were all reduced to refugees and rubble. When the dust settled, the nations of Dawn were standing, but there were visible cracks in the peace. It wasn't long before they broke. The tenuous peace between the peoples of Dawn breaks down into the brutal separatist wars. Brother fights against brother in a struggle for dominance. Baptized in the blood of civil war, the new Ariadne Federation rises, only to meet their strangest opponent yet, Invaders from the Stars. Next time on Warlore, the Ariadne Wars.